Good morning. Welcome to Polk Street United Methodist Church. I'm Leslie Broadbent, the senior pastor here at Polk Street. We want to welcome you warmly to worship with us, whether you are here in person, whether you are joining with us online, or whether you're joining with us on our television broadcast. We want to welcome you warmly. If you are a first-time guest, we want to extend a warm welcome to you as well. We know that in this new year, there are, well, it's a, it's a new year of new beginnings, and so some of us are looking for a new start. And so we we hope and pray. If you are here with us this morning, we hope and pray that you have found us to be a place where you can be yourselves. You found us to be a place where you can grow in your faith. And we've also, I also want you to know that this is a place where you can develop some lifelong Christian friendships. In fact, some generational types of friendships. And so we hope and pray that you have already found us to be such a church. Well, would you stand with me as we begin, as we begin our worship with a word of prayer? Let's pray. Oh God, we thank you for your incredible grace and love for us and in us. Oh God, we pray that your blessings, your grace, your peace would fall upon us afresh and anew in this new year. As we have come here, as we have come here to worship you, oh God, may we, may we, may we lay aside all all, all of our problems, all of, the, all of the anxiety that we carry into this, into this new year. Instead, may we May we simply lay them at the foot of the cross. Come, Lord Jesus. Come and be our Lord. Come and be our Savior as we have come to worship and glorify you in your name. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen. So we indeed are here because Jesus Christ is alive. Amen. seated. Historically, on the first Sunday of a new year or on New Year's Eve, Methodists from around the world gather together and we covenant together in, and we join together in Wesley's covenant renewal service. John Wesley in the mid-1700s came across a, a covenant renewal service that he liked and appreciated so much that he called Methodists together uh, one New Year's Eve, and they called it a watch night service. In that watch night service, they covenanted together using a, an, an ancient prayer. Wesley loved it so much that he began to teach the early Methodists how to use that covenant prayer and to renew that covenant each and every year. And so, since the mid-1700s, Methodists all over the world have come together and have used that covenant prayer. 
And so part of our worship service today will be part of that covenant prayer. Along with that covenant prayer is a time of repentance. Wesley understood. Wesley understood as, and I have come to recognize that revival, personal revival, institutional revival will not and cannot occur until and unless there is true repentance. Did you get that? Revival. Personal revival and institutional revival cannot and will not occur until and unless there is repentance. And so, my sisters and brothers in Christ, we are called to a time of repentance a time of looking inward and confessing our own sin, recognizing that we are not worthy, but instead the Lord Jesus Christ is worthy and offers us grace and forgiveness. So our prayer time will begin with a time of quiet prayer. We'll have have some time of repentance in which you are called to begin to repent of your own sins then we'll have a call and response after, well, we'll have a time in which you can mention aloud those concerns that you have that are weighing heavy on your hearts, and then we'll have that call and response that's in your bulletins. I will say, Lord, in your mercy, and you will, rep- you will reply, hear our prayers. And then finally, our prayer time will conclude with the Lord's Prayer. I invite you to come and pray at the altar. The altar has, has been an important part in my life Many of us have said goodbye to loved ones at an altar rail and funeral services. Many of us have said, I, I, I do, at an altar rail in a, in, a, in a wedding ceremony. And some of us even experience the grace of Jesus Christ for the very first time kneeling at an altar rail. I know in my life there is something I think, I think very mysterious that happens when I bow before my Lord and my God. And you're invited to come and bow and kneel at the altar rail. So let us enter into a time of some quiet solitude prayer. Let us pray. Father God, you have set forth a way of life through Jesus, whom you dearly love. We confess that we have, we have been slow to learn of him and have been reluctant to follow him. You have spoken and called to us, but we have not listened. You have revealed revealed your beauty to us, but we have been blind. You have stretched out your hands to us through our friends, but we have passed them by. We have accepted your gifts and offered little things. We are unworthy of your unchanging love. And so, Lord, we confess our sins. Oh, God, forgive us for our poverty of our worship. for the selfishness of our prayers, for our inconsistency and unbelief, for the ways we neglect fellowship and your grace, for our hesitation to tell others about Christ, for the ways we deceive others. Oh God, forgive us when we waste time and when we misuse the gifts you have given us. Forgive us for when we have made excuses for the wrong things we have done and when we have purposely avoided responsibility. Forgive us that we have been unwilling to uncover and overcome evil with good and that we have not been ready to carry our cross Forgive us that we have not allowed your love to work through us to help others and we have not made their suffering our own. Forgive us for those times when instead of working for unity, we have made it hard for others to live with us because of our lack of forgiveness, inconsiderate judgment, and quick criticism. Forgive us when we have not tried to reconcile with others and when we have been slow to seek redemption. Forgive us. Forgive us now, O Lord, for those sins that we can silently confess to you now. O God, Father of all mercies, 
be faithful and cleanse us from our sins and restore us to Christ's image. All praise and glory be to you, O God, our Father. And on this day, O God, we remember those who are struggling, those who have lost loved ones, those who are sick and hurting. We lift up to you the the family of Lisa Foster, Carlton Clemens and his family on the death of his daughter, Lisa. We lift up to you the family of Billy Johnson, Jennifer White and her family as they're mourning the loss of her father, those who are in the hospital. Likewise, we lift up to you our fellow churches around Amarillo. We pray for Paramount Paramount Baptist Church and Dr. Hubert. We pray for the Salvation Army, Majors Ernest and Deborah Hull. We pray for the Family Life Fellowship and Brother Robbie Ashlock. God, we pray for your blessings upon these great churches. We pray for their pastors and their, their ministries in this new year. And, oh, Lord, we have so many other concerns, and we lift them up to you now. Oh, God, hear these, our prayers. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Oh, God, we know that you are hearing our prayers, and you are answering them in your time and in your manner. And, oh, God, we are sure to give you the honor and the glory and the praise now and forever. And we pray these things through Jesus Christ, who taught us how to pray, our Father, who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As, as the ushers come forward uh, for offering, I have the opportunity as a staff member and for all our church leadership to just thank this church for all the giving of last year, especially at the end of the year uh, during Christmas offerings and rushing to get money in uh, under last year. Uh, I, we, I don't have the amount and everything is going toward right now. Uh, those figures will be available. But we just want to thank you for putting uh, your faith in what God's doing through our church, uh, through our programming, and the missions out. Uh, Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just finished a powerful season of year that reminds us all the blessings you've given us. Many of us had the opportunity to travel, to take a break from work, to see family, to bestow gifts, to do all these things that we can only freely do because you've blessed us so much. Lord, I want to pray that we don't take what you've given us for granted, and we know the power of giving some back to you. Lord, I thank you just for the numbers and faces that we can count of people who've been blessed, God. But I thank you so much more for the names that we might never get, but they're still people who will be forever impacted in knowing you because the work of our church and the gifts of our people. In your name we pray, amen.
So at the very heart of Wesley's covenant renewal service is this covenant prayer. Being a Christian is not easy. Being a true follower of Jesus Christ is not easy because because just as Christ came and gave himself for us, so we who are disciples are called to give of ourselves completely give of ourselves. This is not easy. It goes against every inclination of selfishness that we have. And so, I would invite you to take this bulletin home, and I would invite you to read over this covenant prayer that we are going to be reciting together, to look over it, and to ponder what we really are committing to as followers of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, we offer you this prayer. Let's join our hearts and our voices together. Let me be your servant. Let me follow your commands. 
I will no longer follow my own desires. I give myself completely to your will. I am not my own. I am yours alone. Make me into what you will. Rank me with those you will. Put me to use for you. Put me to suffering for you. Let me be employed for you. Let me be laid aside for you. Let me be lifted for you. Let me be brought low for you. Let me be full or let me be empty. Let me have all things or let me have nothing. With a willing heart, I freely give everything to your pleasure and disposal. From the bottom of my heart, I here and now renounce every idol in my life, covenanting with you that I will not commit any known sins. By turning against your will, I have turned my love toward the world. In your power, I will watch for any temptation that will lead me away from you. Before all heaven and earth, I here and now acknowledge you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, as my Lord and God. I vow to give all of myself, body and soul, to be your servant and to serve you in holiness and righteousness all the days of my life. Jesus Christ is the only way and means to God. God has given us Jesus as the way and means to salvation. Jesus, I here and now accept you and the only new and living way. I join myself in covenant with you. I come to you hungry, sinful, miserable, blind and naked, unworthy even to wash the feet of your servants. With all my power, I accept you as my Lord and head. I renounce my own unworthiness and vow that you are the Lord, my righteousness. I renounce my own wisdom and take you for my only guide. I renounce my own will and take your will as my law. Christ has told you that you must suffer with him. Jesus, I here and now make this covenant with you and accept whatever comes in life. Through your grace, I promise that neither life nor death will separate me from you. And now, glory be to you, God the Father. From this day forward, I shall look upon you as my God and Father. Glory be to you, God the Son. You have loved me and washed me from my sins in your own blood. From this day forward, I shall look upon you as my Savior and Redeemer. Glory be to you, O God the Holy Spirit. By your almighty power, you have turned my heart from sin to God. From this day forward, I shall look upon you as my comforter and guide. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you have now become my covenant friend, and I, through your infinite grace, have become your covenant servant. You are mine, and I am yours. So be it. May this covenant that I have made here on earth be ratified in heaven. Amen. If you will please stand with me for the scripture reading that comes from Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 through 28. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood have not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, 
and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then he strictly charged the disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be killed, and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan, you are a hindrance to me, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Then Jesus told his disciples, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay each person according to what he has done. Truly, I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I want to thank all of you for braving the cold and coming here. Uh, it's great to see so many people return home from wherever you spent the holidays. Uh, I was in 70 degree Alabama and made it back just in time for snow. And since many of you might not have the privilege to have seen my hometown of Huntsville, Alabama, uh, since I'm pretty new here and you might not know me, one assignment at Duke Divinity School I actually enjoyed is I had to write a where I'm from poem. And so I thought it would be a good way to let you know about my hometown, let you know about how I was raised. And so here is my where I'm from moment. I am from yes ma'am, no sure, and no four letter words. Tall Fitz is a good neighbor crying, come on in and get out of my yard. Adventurous treasure hunts with quarries of ticks and poison ivy. I'm from the Tennessee River and man-made private ponds. Dilapidated historical markers and renovated aerospace museums. White collars covering rednecks. I'm from required two-a-days in the humid summer and canceled class at the first glimpse of snow flurries. Freshly baked bread, microwave dinner, and four-course meals at the Waffle House. Late night, exciting fourth quarters, and church early Sunday morning. I'm from a Lucian Bible Belt to accommodate beer belly gluttons. Christianity as a standard and Bible as a class. I'm from big expectations from Little League, building character and building resumes, following the dream while hoping it's not a nightmare, making home of where I am, striving for where I'm going, but not forgetting where I'm from. And if you ask me, I think that's a pretty good origin story. But that might not be quite as good as the story that we've been spending a lot of time talking about for the past month or so. The story that was of a savior that was prophesied for hundreds of years, uh, especially here at Polk Street when we have such a wonderful choir and people involved in all of this Advent and Christmas liturgy. It really prepares us for how great this journey to Bethlehem has been. And the picture of Jesus in the manger is probably the most comforting picture of Jesus we have. Even the hymns tell us how well-behaved baby Jesus was. We just want to put him in a baby Bjorn and have Emmanuel God with us, with us wherever we go. Such a nice baby that if he was taken to the temple, all the Pharisees and Sadducees would swoon over him. And Bethlehem is great. It's the place where we first declare Jesus God. It's the place where we begin to build a Christ theology. 
And it can be a place that's very tempting for us to begin and end our faith. Because things begin to get a little bit more difficult once Jesus grows up. There's advantages uh, of a baby. Uh, For one thing, a baby is just this bundle of potential. And we can project whatever we want on the baby. There's something about superiority we have with the fragility of the baby and we're the ones that need to take care of it and provide for it. And this baby should grow up respecting us as its elders. But when Jesus grows up, it's a little bit more of a complicated God to serve. Because Jesus begins living out the plan that God ordained. And that doesn't look like the plan that any of us or any of the Jews would have projected it. But it's just the way that God had it planned. It gets a little bit difficult because Emmanuel is no longer a baby that we can come take with us, but a grown rabbi who says, follow me, and we must follow him to stay with him. And if it's not enough gall for Jesus to say, follow me, he leads us to places that we wouldn't normally go on our own and begins teaching us to do things that we wouldn't want to do on our own. And in the Old Testament, it was pretty easy. There were these special locations where you could experience God. And if you wanted to experience God, you went to the temple, you went to mountaintops, you went to the desert. It was great. Well, now that God's on earth, it's less about where we are and more about who we're with. And for that reason, sometimes Jesus will call us away from places that we believe are really comfortable, really safe, really prosperous, that are just filled with God's blessings. And Jesus calls us to go to a brand new location. And I got that taste pretty early in my adulthood. I told you a little bit about Huntsville. When I graduated high school, I knew that God was calling me away to go to a Christian college. But at that time, we were in an economic recession, and Huntsville had just been voted the number one city in America to live in. But I felt the call to go to a small Christian college right outside of Atlanta in East Point, Georgia. A couple of years after I graduated, I found out that East Point, Georgia, while I was there, was rated the most dangerous city in America. And that I had went from the best place to live to the most dangerous place to live. And it kind of makes sense looking back. That one night when my friends came into my apartment, my roommates, and they told me, hey, we've just been carjacked at Shotgun Point. Uh, the, the, the idea that when you left this one-mile circumference campus, you went into some not-so-good area. So that's probably why my college campus moved two years into me being there. And I'm kind of glad I didn't find out until years after I graduated, because if we would have found that out earlier, my parents might have tried to persuade me to go to a different college. But, but in spite of all that... East Point, Georgia, was where I felt called by God to go. And the moment I stepped on Camp Base, out of all my college visits, it was the place that I knew God had something for me. It's the place where I first felt my call to ministry. Being so close to Atlanta, Georgia, I had all of these opportunities to learn about youth ministry and to go to churches that were thriving in youth ministry. And my ministry today is heavily impacted because... I ultimately followed the call to the most dangerous city in America without knowing it. And the verse we read, I think, also shows Jesus leading us into uncomfortable places. I believe that Caesarea Philippi is the second most uncomfortable place that Jesus led anybody. Caesarea Philippi, uh, centuries before it had that name, it was known as Bineus. And if you look at the handout, you'll see a lot of pictures. It's going to be your job to find out which one I'm talking about. But we'll begin with the one that looks like a cave. That is a grotto. Here are some things about early people. They were very superstitious about underground and about running water. And that mixed with how eerie that cave entrance looks made it a place that people would want to stay away from until the Greeks took over the land. Because they were also super, superstitious, but they believed, hey, this is an entryway between the underworld and our world. This is where fertility gods go back to the underworld. They named the area the Gates of Hades. 
and they built a shrine to the fertility god Pan, and Pan was a fertility god. Some of the worship practices they had were the most vulgar and immoral. And then the Romans took over the land, and the Romans decided that this is a really key area for defense of our kingdom. It's a key area for trade. And so they put King Herod in charge of it. And we talked a little bit about King Herod a few weeks ago. But King Herod was the Jewish leader. And he had traded any Jewishness he had for political power. So when he received this land to thank Caesar, he built a temple to Caesar right by the temple to Pan. And he built himself a really nice palace that could overlook it. And then Herod died and his son, Philip, took over. And he decided to continue this praise by naming the city after the two greatest leaders ever, Caesar and himself. And so he named the land Caesarea Philippi. All those regions kind of made this the place that Galilean Jews would not want to visit. In fact, it was known as one of the most evil and immoral places that you could enter in this, you know, area close to Jerusalem. And yet, this area is the area that Jesus chose to take a 25-mile trip out of his way, out from his home base in Galilee, to teach one of the most important messages of the gospel. And he asked the most important question that any of us will ever answer. Who do you say that I am? And he had a lot of great answers. You're a great prophet. You're a great leader. And those were huge compliments to anybody but Jesus. Because Jesus wasn't the prophet. He was the prophecy fulfilled. And so Simon Peter, in the stroke of genius or just luck, is able to say, you're the son of God. He makes this proclamation that we've been making all Advent and Christmas season. That Jesus is God. And Jesus begins to talk about how great this proclamation is. He says that it's a rock. And depending on what church you go to, people believe that means different things. Our Catholic brothers and sisters believe that Jesus is making a play off the name Peter. And they made Peter their first pope. I've heard people say it's like when Jesus talks about the wise man building a house and the rock is the foundation. Uh, I, I take stuff really literally. Jesus is standing right by a really big rock. And then he goes and talks about the gates of hell, and I've heard a lot of explanation about what the gates of hell might mean. Jesus is standing right by an area called the gates of hell. And I might not go deep enough in my biblical interpretation. But I think it's pretty significant that Jesus took them here and said these words. Because that's pretty scary stuff for the disciples to hear. They're at a place that's filled with sin. During the festival of Pan, I'm pretty sure every one of the Ten Commandments was broken. And they could see all this sin and all this false God worship. They could look down, they could see the palace to Caesar, um, the temple to Caesar and the palace of Herod, these two great political monuments. They were aware how close they were to these key places where Caleb and David stood in the Old Testament. And Jesus chose this location to preach that message, talking about how his kingdom is going to be greater than this sinful Worship. And it's going to be even greater than all this political power that seems to be ruling. And I don't think Jesus is a very shy person. I think he's preaching this loud enough that the people at Pan's shrine can hear him. And I'm pretty sure the disciples are trying to hush him down because he's in the front yard of King Herod who just killed John the Baptist for making political claims. And so... We see Jesus talking about none of these gates will stand. He says, I will offer you the keys. And Peter, knowing him, might have been ready to run down there and open the keys to the rest of the disciples. I think it was less of them being afraid of the gates of hell. And it was more something inside of them that wasn't quite ready. 
Maybe it was fear. Maybe it was inadequacy. Maybe it was even though my sins aren't as bad as the sins they're committing, I'm still not ready to be this prophet. And Jesus still goes on and teaches. Because they're missing a big piece. What will this key be? What will this message of boldness be to give us this boldness? And Jesus begins saying, it's going to come from me dying on the cross. And Peter confronts him. And he, here's what we learn. No one was really ready to fully know what that meant. They knew about crucifixion. They knew about the cross. They knew that was not the place where revelations began. It was the place where revelations, where uh, they ended. Because that's where the Romans would kill, torture to death anyone who tried to overthrow the kingdom. And now Jesus is saying that's where the kingdom will start. And no one really gets here. And then we have this really key note that after Jesus preaches here, he begins turning back to Jerusalem. And Jesus knows that Jerusalem is where he'll breathe his last breath on the cross. He'll fulfill this message that he just gave. And if you were to look at my sermon notes, this is where they kind of end. Because it's so hard to see how these disciples go from people who don't understand the message, who are afraid, who, who don't seem to get Jesus at all, to men who are willing to die for Jesus. And I, I've got taken like a hit on my preaching ego, because it's not really something I can explain, but it's something I know. It's something that I've felt so many times in ministry. It's a boldness, it's a vision that came out of nowhere, except I knew it was from God. And I don't know how to put that into words, so the best thing I can do is tell you the closest story and analogy that's not spiritual. And so my first semester, when I was in East Point, Georgia, I was taking a youth ministry class. And part of it was going to the National Youth Worker Convention in Nashville, Tennessee. And me being 18 years old, I didn't plan ahead. I left at last minute, and Atlanta, Georgia has some pretty bad traffic. So I ran into rush hour early. And one really fun thing about time zones is it's possible to hit two rush hours. <laughs> and so I, I was already late. There was no way I could make up time. There was no way I could get to the seminar I had to make to on time legally. I said legally. This is, I'm past the statute of limitations, so if Josh is out here, let me finish. Um, so I began to speed, and speed pretty bad. And I know at one point, I was at the top of a hill somewhere in Tennessee, and I looked down, and I see the top of a police car with a radar gun. And I know that I can't slow down in time. I look over to my left, I see two tractor trailers, and I have a plan. I cut between them, pass on the other side. Thanks for laughing, I could have died. Um, but I made it to Nashville. I was a little bit late, but I didn't care at that point. I was staying with friends. I bragged. I, this was the height of the Fast and Furious movies, all right? I, I wanted someone to get that on film, not the police officer. But that was a really big highlight of the trip. And... Uh, I was going home after that. It was a long weekend, so I went back to Huntsville. And on my way back, driving late at night, I passed a horrible car accident. And what crossed my mind is, man, that guy can't drive as good as me. What crossed my mind is, that should have been me. And for that moment, just being aware of that huge price that that person paid may be completely aware that if I don't change the way I'm driving, if I don't become more prepared, that's a sacrifice that I'm going to make too. And the only time I've had something similar has been those spiritual moments. That I can't explain how I went from fear to being bold. I can't explain from not knowing what I'm going to do to God telling me exactly the pathway to fulfill my ministry. All I know is when I come 
into the heaviness of the cross and what Jesus did, I become more aware of the message. And I said yesterday of Philippi, which is the second most, uh, second most uncomfortable place Jesus leads people, the first is the cross. But for some reason, this reaction of being fully aware of what Jesus did in that sacrifice has turned into that should have been me. Enable me to overcome sins in my life, to overcome inadequacies and weaknesses, to, to let me know my plans in my future. And not only that, but to know, hey, this is a big deal for more people than just me. I don't need to just hog the cross. I need to make it available to other people who need it too. And Jesus transforms the cross into this horrific torture item that we see the disciples react to in Caesarea Philippi to the place where we hold dearly. Uh, but Jesus transforms more. Caesarea Philippi, I was talking to Pastor Kevin, and Caesarea Philippi is no longer the place you avoid. It's now a national park that families go to. And Pastor Kevin told me that on one of his trips to Israel, they had a marriage renewal service right outside the gates of hell. And to me, my mind immediately thought, man, that's awesome. The place where all this immorality and vulgarity to impress Pan no longer exists. It turned into a place where people can form and renew marriages with that boldness and power in Jesus. It's that boldness and power that has gotten me from Huntsville to East Point, all over the southeast, and now to Amarillo, because I believe that there are gates that God's brought me here to help open and bring the kingdom of God in, and I think that there's places in my life that I'm already seeing God working on me through being here. And I know this church has already started that movement, and that there's kids who were able to experience the kingdom of God at Christmas through the gifts you've given, and through meals that you provide, and through volunteering that you do. And I believe that there's so much more through talking with the staff and leadership and church members, so many more places in the kingdom of God that's calling. But I think it all begins with becoming aware of that heaviness of the cross. And, and I can't say that if you come down and pray, you'll get it. I've just learned to always try to keep myself in the posture to be ready for it. Because I don't know when I'm going to get it, but I don't want to miss it. But we're at a very powerful moment. We call it a sacrament. And these are places that heaven and earth kind of meet differently. It's deep theology. Pastor Leslie will tell you about it. Um, but we're about to go through the Lord's Supper. And the Lord's Supper is a time where we all have the freedom to experience the heaviness of the sacrifice of Jesus. And during this time, I invite you to think and remember that time. To use it to look at yourself and see what, what fears and sins and inadequacies can me focusing on Jesus remove from my life? And, and then look out and say, hey, what are the areas that at one point might be scary, that might be uncomfortable, that are really the places that God's calling me? So I'm going to invite Pastor Leslie to come up and lead us in communion. This table is not our table. This is the Lord's table. And all who earnestly repent of their sins are invited to come and participate and to partake. So you don't need to be a member of this church or even any church. All are invited to partake. Would you turn in your hymnals number, to page number 13 as we join together in the great thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church. 
delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples, and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living, as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon us gathered here and upon these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and the blood of Christ, that we might be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Christ was broken, that we might be made whole. Christ was emptied, that we might be filled. I would ask that those who will be assisting with communion, if they would come forward. As they are coming forward, I want to uh, offer you some instructions. As you come forward for Holy Communion, if you would come forward through the center aisles, return to your seats uh, up the outside aisles, we would appreciate that. We have a gluten-free station over to your right, uh, and so if you need a gluten-free option, that is available over to your right. As you come forward for communion, you'll be offered the elements, and you can partake of those elements wherever you wish. If you would like to return to your seats and partake of those, you're welcome to do so. If you'd like to come and kneel at the altar rail, you're welcome to do so. We will not have a formal dismissal as you are taking communion. At, at, when you, if you come to the communion rail, you can simply come and pray for as long as you would like and then finally return to your seats. Where shepherds lately knelt and kept the angels were I come in half Pilgrim strangely stirred, but there is room and welcome there for me. But there is room and welcome there for me. Oh, Lord. 
Would you bow with me, please? Oh God, we thank you for this mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Now, now we give ourselves to you and to others. Bless us, oh God, as we give of ourselves. Through Christ our Lord, we pray. Amen. Would you please stand with me? This Jesus is no, is no just some ordinary rabbi. This Jesus is no ordinary prophet. No, this Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Go and serve this eternal Son in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.